Donald Trump indicted again by Jack Smith. We have three conspiracies, four criminal counts, six co-conspirators, one named defendant, Donald Trump, and one federal judge, Obama appointee, Judge Tanya Chutkin, who will all collide tomorrow for surrender, arrest, and arraignment in District of Columbia. We unpack the 125 paragraph indictment, the featured roles of Mike Pence, not a co-conspirator, and Rudy Giuliani, a featured co-conspirator, the contributions of the Jan 6 committee report, and what to expect next, including potential separate indictments in separate cases of the other co-conspirators, as well as Trump's lawyers already trying to cook up a free speech, reliance on counsel, no criminal intent set of defenses. Then we update everyone on the developments in the Mar-a-Lago criminal prosecution, with Carlos de Oliveira having his arraignment postponed, sound familiar, while Stan Woodward, the trump pact appointed and paid for lawyer facing ethical conflict of interest hearing sought by the Department of Justice based on the fact that he represents five of the main witnesses or co-conspirators in the Mar-a-Lago superseding indictment. Will he be able to continue to represent Walt Nauta, Molly Michael, Haley Harrison, all at the same time while having once represented lead cooperating co-conspirator IT worker Yusil Tavares? Finally, our eyes turn to Fawny Willis in Fulton County, where she gave a recent interview that her work is now done after just two and a half weeks of the regular grand jury presentation, as she owes it to the people of Fulton County and the U.S. to indict people like Trump who interfered in the election, while her old boss, Fulton County Superior Court Judge McBurney, denied Trump's latest attempt to disqualify Fawny and throw out her seven months of special purpose grand jury work. And the sheriff of Fulton County says that if Trump is indicted, he'll be mugshot and fingerprinted like the rest. The Department of Justice Special Counsel's Office now has two indictments, or three, in the less in less than nine months of being on the job. They have the right indictment now for the right crimes, for the right moment, the right court, and the right judge. Karen, it is literally exhausting, but exhilarating to see accountability and justice in real time, as we predicted. And now we're just talking about the timing of criminal trials, not the ifs and whens or or who knows when of indictments, with Fawny Willis ready to strike in about three weeks to give us four total indictments of Trump at state federal levels for his actions while campaigning for office, while in office, his refusal to leave office, and after he left office. And if all of this was not enough, Midas Touch launched a brand new website, and we have all new Legal AF t-shirts and designs. God, all this and so much more on the midweek edition of Legal AF Podcast, only one place, the Midas Touch Network, with your hosts for the midweek, Michael Popak and Karen Friedman, Agnifilo, KFA. Ah, It's so great to see you again. (laughs) Yeah, a lot going on, right? It's crazy. You you said two or three indictments by Jack Smith, and the reason you uh, the reason you said that was because you know people are wondering. It's because Mar-a-Lago. Don't forget, Trump was indicted twice, right? He was indicted the first time, and then a superseding indictment. So that's and he's going to have to be arraigned on that superseding Mar-a-Lago indictment because uh, that's how it is. It's a brand new charging instrument that has brand new charges. And and, uh, and then we have the one that just came down yesterday, the Jan, the one we've all been waiting for, the indictment against our democracy, the Jan 6 one. Yes, it is exhausting. I'm exhausted. You know, I, I did a marathon yesterday on CNN with, you know, until one o'clock in the morning uh, reporting on this stuff. And I keep thinking, God, how all these marathons keep happening over and over again. And then I realize it's because we have a former president who's a one man crime spree. I mean, the guy now has four indictment, has been indicted four times, the two superseding, the Jan 6, Alvin Bragg, and then we're gonna soon get Fonnie Willis. I mean, you know, even career criminals who you who are traditional career criminals don't get five indictments in a year. I mean, this is just unprecedented. It's unbelievable to me what a what a one man crime spree he, he is. He, it's the most and best set of indictments ever for a former president. I think he's up to if I'm doing my math right, 37, 34, four, and I think four. He's up to 80, 80 felony counts 
between all the indictments we just talked about. And Fonnie Willis hasn't even indicted yet. So that and it doesn't even include the Trump organization, right? That was convicted recently right. last so, year. Alvin Bragg. So let's yeah. do that. Let's add 17 okay. to 80 because there were 17 counts in New York State Supreme brought by your old office, the Manhattan DA, who got a 17 count conviction. That's 97. And now we bring in Fonnie Willis with at least I mean, I don't think she does four. I think she does 10 or 12. Um, yeah, it is exhausting. I'm so glad to be here with you. You and I did a marathon um, live with Ben Mycellus and Michael Cohen yesterday. We had a half a million people. We were the number one YouTube for, not just for news. We're the number one YouTube live in the world yesterday reporting on the indictment. I literally, as I was doing my part, people could hear in the background my really cheap printer printing the indictment because that's... We learned about it minute zero, and by minute nine, we were on the air. And so we were all scrambling to read. I was what commenting we could. on it. I hadn't even seen it. <laughs> well, that's Ben. <laughs> ben will go, let's go. One minute to airtime. I'll go, Ben, you know? I, you, we haven't even read it. Who, you don't need, just let's go. So <laughs> it, it, you know, it's literally 130 paragraphs. And so I was making my way through. I was able to find, and we'll do it here too. Now that we've had more more time, we've had more time for reflection, sober sober reflection. So let me let me kick it off with some things that I found interesting and have been reported about the indictment, and then turn it over to you for the prosecutor's view, which is always invaluable, especially here on the show. And I want to talk about it a little bit about what's not in there, what doesn't have to be in there, and what is in there. I'll tell you what's not in there. Things that we were reporting on about, at least in the indictment, I'm not saying in the case to be tried, in the evidence to be presented, but in the indictment, there's no reference of the uh, December 2020 crazy meeting in the White House between Donald Trump, Sidney Powell, Michael Flynn, and the Overstock.com founder, which I like to call Overthrow.com, in which they were talking about suspending the Constitution and invoking martial law to seize voting machines. Will that be a trial? Probably. It wasn't necessary to be in the indictment. Jack Smith didn't think so, and I'll agree with him. I think he came up with a very elegant 130 paragraph, one defendant, three conspiracies, four counts. It could have been 4,000 counts. It could have been hundreds of people, but it wasn't. And it wasn't, and it wasn't that, not by accident, but by prosecutorial discretion and really surgical and precise pleading. Just enough just enough in a speaking indictment to put the country on notice and Donald Trump as the defendant in a Sixth Amendment right about what he's been charged with, but not so much that we're going to be bored at the trial. Let's just put it that way. There's going to be plenty of witnesses and facts that are going to come out, including through people like Mike Pence. And we're going to talk about the six uh, co-conspirators and whether they're going to be indicted or not. So that's the most interesting thing for me, the things that aren't in there. The other things that aren't in there is blaming Donald Trump for what happened on Jan 6th. The planning of it that's going to be wild tweet, the, the getting buses there. But instead, Jack Smith, after nine months of investigation and, and standing on the shoulders of the Jan 6th committee, instead said the better argument is that they didn't, they didn't plan the Jan 6th insurrectionist attack, but they tried to take advantage of it once it was in motion. And so that was an interesting new twist in the indictment for me, as opposed to how the Jan 6th committee sort of framed it based on the evidence they had, which which Jack Smith has plus. He's got Jan 6 plus, you know, like a streaming service. He gets, he because he has dozens of more witnesses that he was able to strip of attorney-client privilege and force them to testify. So we don't see that here. Again, because he made a prosecutorial decision that the weight of the evidence that he has at his disposal that he's going to use for his indictment doesn't support the planning and starting of it. It, it, it supports the using of it. The fire was started and they used the fire as an excuse to try to further delay the peaceful transfer of power. The other thing that's not in the indictment that was in the Jan 6 committee reporting, which I found interesting, was any argument about the grift using the big lie that he had lost the election to raise money, to separate money in a wire fraud or mail fraud count from donors and use that money to pay for lawyers as a cover up or interference with witnesses and the and the investigation could have been in there may still be presented tangentially as evidence at trial but not in the indictment all right that's not what's in the indictment what is in the indictment well 
It's a, if you follow the Jan 6 committee closely, including their final report in December, you're not going to be disappointed because that same five step chain of the conspiracy and the, you know, is really almost exactly the same as what the Jan 6 committee pre- presented to us. And what I thought I'd like to do is just go to those particular links in the conspiracy. So for people, when they walk off of the show, they can say, well, what was that indictment all about? Here are the five easy pieces, if you will, of the, of the conspiracy. And we'll find it on paragraph 10 of the indictment in subparagraphs A through E. And I'm going to just, I'll, parap- I'll, I'll read some of it verbatim, but I'll paraphrase other parts. Um, and this is the conspiracy to, de- to through dishonesty, fraud, and deceit to defeat, obstruct, or impair or, or, uh, a uh, function of the federal government. In this case, vote counting, electoral certificate certification, and the like. Um, first step, the defendant and the co-conspirator, so that's Trump and the co-conspirators, use knowingly false claims of election fraud to get state legislators and election officials to subvert the legitimate election results and change electoral votes for the defendant's opponent, Joe Biden, to electoral votes for the defendant. That is, on the pretext of baseless fraud claims, the defendant pushed officials in certain states, those are the battleground states, to ignore the popular vote, disenfranchise millions of voters, dismiss legitimate electors, and ultimately cause the ascertainment of and voting by illegitimate electors in favor of the defendant. That is the fake elector scheme. Two, step two in the conspiracy, the defendant and co-conspirators organize fraudulent slates of electors in seven targeted states, Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Nevada, New Mexico, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, attempting to mimic the procedures that legitimate electors were supposed to follow under the constitution. And this included them meeting uh, and gathering, casting a vote, casting fraudulent votes for the defendant, and signing certificates falsely representing that they were legitimate electors. Um, the defendant and co-conspirators then caused these fraudulent electors to transmit their false certificates to the vice president and other government officials to be counted at the certification proceeding on Jan 6. Moving to step three, the defendant and co-conspirators attempted to use the power and authority of the Justice Department. That would be Jeff Clark, to conduct sham election crime investigations and to send a letter to the targeted states that falsely claimed that the Justice Department had identified significant concerns that may have impacted the election outcome that sought to advance the defendant's fraudulent elector plan by using the Justice Department's authority to falsely present the fraudulent electors as a valid alternative to the legitimate electors. Here we go, number four step in the conspiracy chain, fourth badge of the conspiracy. The defendant and co-conspirators attempted to enlist the vice president to use his ceremonial role at the Jan 6 certification proceeding to fraudulently alter the election results. That is the pressure campaign on Mike Pence. And when that failed, on the morning of Jan 6, the defendant and co-conspirators repeated knowingly false claims of elections fraud to gathered supporters, falsely told them that the vice president had the authority to and might alter the election result, and directed them to the Capitol to obstruct the certification proceeding and exert pressure on the vice president. And then lastly, this big conspiracy after it became public on the afternoon of Jan 6th that the vice president would not fraudulently alter the election results, a large and angry crowd, including many individuals whom defendant had deceived into believing the vice president could and might change the election results, violently attacked the Capitol and halted the proceedings. As violence ensued, the defendant, Trump and co-conspirators exploited the disruption by redoubling efforts to levy false claims of election fraud and convince members of Congress to further delay the certification based on those claims. That, in a nutshell, if you take nothing away from the 129 paragraph indictment, that is the five-step conspiracy. And then we just, the window dressing, of course, is the four uh, four crimes that uh, uh Jack Fraud is is prepared to use. I'll have Karen Freeman Niffalo talk about that. And then, of course, we've got, lastly, the co-conspirators. And I'll let Karen comment on 
one through five, and then she and I can have a fun game of trying to predict who number six is. I was able to, I think, rightly pick one through five last night. And six, I've come around with a hot take as to who I think number six is. I want to hear from Karen. So why don't you talk about the indictment from your perspective? You have a very, you were dead on about the size and shape of it and the reason for that. And I want you, that's a valuable opinion. I want you to contribute here. So why don't you take it, take it away, Karen Friedman Niflo. Yeah. So look, you know, we, we often say we're reading the tea leaves, but we're not really just reading tea leaves. We're bringing our experience and our expertise and our analysis to what we see happening. And we make, uh, we give our predictions or our assumptions and, you know, they, they typically turn out to be either right or close to right on legal AF. I will say we're, I think we're pretty much on the money when it comes to most of these things. And, and this was no different. You know, this was a, Donald Trump is, is kind of like a, a one man crime spree. I hate to say it, you know, I mean, this number of indictments in this short amount of time with this number of crimes is, is sort of unheard of. Uh, I don't know anyone or too many people who are have that number of charges being brought against him. And, and Jack, Jack Smith could have brought, as, as we've said many times, hundreds of different counts uh, against Donald Trump and others. This could have been a 20, 25 uh, defendant case, you know, but look, in the end, you can't fit that many people in a courtroom at a table. You're going to have to split it up anyway. And so if you're, if you're going to have to do that as a prosecutor, it takes a really experienced prosecutor to do what Jack Smith did. A, a junior prosecutor, someone without a lot of experience, doesn't have the confidence to not throw the kitchen sink and everything that they have, that they know, just in case in the indictment, they will charge every possible charge that they can and every possible defendant that they can. And um, it's kind of, a big mistake. A, a, a real seasoned uh, prosecutor who knows what they're doing will say, okay, look, you know, let's keep it simple and keep it uh, straightforward and to, you know, to use your term, surgical, right? So think about every time you charge a crime, you have to prove each and every element of that crime beyond a reasonable doubt, right? And every crime has multiple elements. And when you sit through a jury charge, you hear those elements and the judge will tell the jury, you know, you have to find that this defendant acted intentionally and that this defendant acted knowingly and that on or about such and such a date, he, you know, did X, he did Y and he did Z. And then, you know, it's like this, and, and the jury goes back there and they have to find each and every one of those elements beyond a reasonable doubt. So the more charges you put in there, you're just there's more things that you have that your jury needs to agree on. So why not just put the strongest cases, right? So or the strongest charges. And that's what Jack Smith did here. He could have also put in seditious conspiracy, for example, just like he charged like the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys were charged with seditious conspiracy. Uh, you know, that's that's a charge that that a lot of us were, were hoping, uh, myself included, would be in there. But, you know, look, there's an argument to be made that he didn't necessarily conspire with the Stuart Rhodeses of the world to inflict violence on the Capitol on January 6th. And so therefore, a jury could argue, you know, could have an issue with that. Why hang the jury up on, on that? Why potentially get an acquittal on a charge like that? He'll just take that, Donald Trump will take that and say, see, I've been vindicated. And, you know, look, there's a First Amendment arg argument that I think fails, but it's his defense regarding his speech on the ellipse, right? He's going to say, I had a First Amendment right. I'm a politician. I can say these things. I didn't know what they were going to do. In fact, I told them to be peaceful. So he, by, by not charging that, Jack Smith once again brilliantly took that argument off the table. And he doesn't have to prove those elements beyond a reasonable doubt, which are thin anyway. So that was very smart to do. And that's how he looked at it. Same thing with charging multiple defendants, right? The more defendants you charge in there, the more you have multiple defense attorneys who will each make their own arguments, who will each come out and try to um, say, you know, make motions before the court, which could delay things. I mean, look what's happening in the Mar-a-Lago case that we're going to talk about soon. You've only three defendants there and three defense attorneys, and you've already had multiple delays because somebody wasn't 
um, you know, they're not, they weren't in Florida or barred in Florida. So they couldn't, you know, he needed to get a lawyer and in, in, who's barred in Florida. Then that happened to, to Mr. De Oliveira as well. And so it got delayed there. And, you know, it, it becomes death by a thousand cuts is, is what I always say here. Um, and that's, that's what, what would happen. And so Jack Smith is like, no, we're going to keep it simple. We're going to have it be just Donald Trump, just his lawyers making his legal arguments. And I'm not going to charge the, char the, the, the counts. I'm not going to charge the crimes that have your defenses. Not that I can't, I can't overcome them, but why, why not just take them off the table, especially when he's facing something like more than 20 years with the four charges that he put here. So I think it shows that he's very experienced. He knows what he's doing. And he wants a trial before the election. And the, 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 the surest way to get that to happen is to have the most straightforward, simple case. This case, unlike the Mar-a-Lago case, also doesn't have the issue of classified documents. So you don't have to get, you don't have to go through the very laborious, long process of getting the defense attorneys to have top secret clearance so that they can view them. You don't have to have the laborious process of going through document by document with the court and determining, uh, and then telling intelligence community, how can we sanitize the information contained in these documents or summarize them so these documents or portions of them can be utilized at trial as in, you know, to put in evidence because you have to prove, you know, it's a public trial and you have to prove uh, your, your facts you know, beyond a reasonable doubt by putting the evidence in. And so with classified documents, that cl uh, complicates things. There's nothing like that here. So Jack Smith really streamlined and simplified this case by doing it the way he did it. And, you know, he charged conspiracy, which we, we've all learned and know now because so many people have followed legal AF that a conspiracy count is a talking indictment, right? That whole count one of the indictment, which is um, 18 United States Code Section 371 is uh, is count one, and that has the all of the conspiracies, right, and all the facts in it. He put the three different conspiracies in there. He put all of the facts in there, and then counts two, three, and four look like a normal indictment. The bare bones, just you know, three sentences, you know, on or about such and such a date, the defendant committed X, Y, and Z. That's what normal indictments look like. But you can do a talking indictment like this when you charge things like conspiracy, which is what uh, Jack Smith did. And so he got all the facts in there. He told the story and the evidence, and he put his strongest evidence forward. A couple other things I just want to point out about the indictment uh, that I that stuck out to me, which is the co-conspirators. There were six of them, right? And he and and there are ways that um, that people will talk about uh, things in indictments that are uniform and standard and customary throughout the country, and especially in the Department of Justice. And one of the things that uh, the Department of Justice usually does is if you're charging someone who, it, with a conspiracy and there are co-conspirators who are not named in the indictment, uh, right? Because if there was a co-conspirator who was named in the indictment, you would just say defendant Trump and defendant Giuliani, right, are co-conspirators. You would name them. But if somebody's not charged, you don't typically name them because, you know, look, it's 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 not appropriate to um, to cast, you know, somebody aspersions on somebody and charge them with a crime when they haven't been charged with a crime. So you don't name people who you are accusing you know, but of, a, of committing a crime if you haven't charged them. And the way that is done always is it's done as unindicted co-conspirator number one, unindicted co-conspirator number two, unindicted co-conspirator number three. That is the way most, if not all indictments typically look that are, that, that do that. Now you have to understand Jack Smith's uh, indictment that we have all read has been wordsmithed to death, not to you know pun intended, right? Wordsmithed. It's been looked at by by many, 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 many eyes. Every single word that is in there has been negotiated, changed, and is deliberate. So it's very deliberate that in that indictment it says co-conspirator one, co-conspirator two. It does not say unindicted co-conspirator one, right? It's omitting the word unindicted. What that tells me is they've been indicted. So I believe that the six co-conspirators have been indicted. They just haven't filed the indictment yet. It hasn't been unsealed yet. They haven't, it hasn't gone public yet. And 
and perhaps the they will come out uh they will see that as well and they will try to negotiate with jack smith some kind of a cooperation agreement prior to this becoming public now I think everybody agrees that co-conspirator number one is Giuliani, number two is John Eastman, number three is Sidney Powell, number four is Jeffrey Clark, and number five is Ken Cheesebro. But the head scratcher has been uh, has been co-conspirator number six, and you know I and others thought at first. It probably just given the facts, looked like it might be Boris, Boris Epstein. But the problem is he's a lawyer and it doesn't describe him as a lawyer where the other co-conspirators are described as lawyers. But the New York Times is reporting today that they compared an email uh, that they have that was sent uh, I think it was by Boris Epstein or to Boris Epstein. Um, and the factual scenario is identical to what's in the indictment. And so, yeah. So they're calling it as <laughs> Boris now. I, I did um, a hot take and I'm going with Boris. I originally said last night when we did it that I agree because they were very careful in calling this attorney, this attorney, this attorney, right. this attorney, but it's almost like a diss by the justice department. Boris Epstein is an attorney, but mm -hmm. he's also a uh, self-proclaimed political consultant for Donald Trump. We know he's an attorney because he gets to sit at the big boy table whenever there is an arraignment. Every time we've seen um, Donald Trump sweating, cold, cold flop sweating in a courtroom, usually cold flop sweating next to him is Boris Epstein. He's the guy that also brought in uh, Todd Blanche to be the lawyer for Donald Trump and made the switch and got really rid of Joe Tacopina. I assume he was involved with bringing in John Lauro. But yeah, I think it's interesting because I, I read that Times article and I thought it was anyway, just because of the role that Boris played as the centerpiece of coordinating all of the fake electors and all of the fake elector ground game ran it, ran, was really run, not by Mike Roman, even though Mike Roman was election day coordinator and did run around literally grabbing the election certificates and forwarding them. But the person that they were reporting to apparently was not Mark Meadows, was not Giuliani, was not even John Eastman or Cheeseboro. It was Boris Epstein. And we've said for a long time here on Legal AF that Boris Epstein had a tremendous target on his back. I was surprised he wasn't indicted already, given uh, the fact they picked up the Justice Department picked up his cell phone six months ago, his text messages. He's part of Operation Coconut, which is the internal investigation taint team for the Justice Department uh, Special Counsel's Office, looking at all the lawyers, for former lawyers and current lawyers for Donald Trump's text messages, including Cleta Mitchell and him. So <clears throat> listen, I, I, think, I think we have that. Before we leave, though, we've gone through the co-conspirators, we've gone through all that. I want to talk about the defenses that are already being raised and of already being crapped on by lead witnesses like Mike Pence. One of the ones that's been floated over the last week or so by the new lawyer for Donald Trump, John Lauro on television and otherwise, is reliance on counsel. They're gonna to try to argue that because Donald Trump had a bunch of, I'll use Mike Pence's phrase, crackpot lawyers around him, giving him advice about what the, vice president can or can't do constitutionally to interfere with the election or certify the election um, and other advice from Giuliani, Cleta Mitchell, Cindy Powell, Jenna Ellis, um, Boris Epstein and the rest, or team crazy as we like to call it, um, but that he has some sort of out that he'll be able to run in front of a jury and as a legitimate defense to try to defeat criminal intent, willfulness, and what we call mens rea, because you see it in all of their talking points. Stephen Chung, you know, the president's spokesperson who's always trotted out every day for some sort of statement, you know, multiple lawyers around Donald Trump. We saw John Lauro try it. And the second one that they're trying out, including as early as today, and we have a clip of John Lauro, he's like the new Joe Tacopina, um, is First Amendment, First Amendment, First Amendment. All, all that Donald Trump was doing was First Amendment speech because he believed he won. And if you read the indictment carefully, it has nothing to do with First Amendment speech. Jack Smith and his team were very careful to talk about conduct, interference with the election, fake elector certificates, um, you know, you know, uh, using the Jan 6 insurrection that's going on as a, an ability, as a tip of the spear in order to 
try to stop the peaceful transfer of power, the pressure campaign, knowing, knowing based on facts that you lost given to you by your national intelligence director, your head of cybersecurity protection for the election, your general White House counsel, your deputy White House counsel, your, your attorney general, uh, election officials in states that voted for you, uh, secretaries of state, speakers of the house, you can't as a reasonable person, therefore bury your head and cover your eyes and ignore those facts and then continue under some sort of first amendment to continue to berate election and elected officials to try to convert votes and tell people fraud about the election. So um, th th that is the two levels of defense. I wanna cover all of that and get back to both um, some interesting things about the Department of Justice that's in the that's in the uh, indictment, and get Karen's view on these defenses and how do you think they're going to work in in a, in a courtroom, which is where we ply our trade. But first, here's a word from our sponsor. I'm so excited to say that this episode is brought to you by Eight Sleep. We've spent almost half our lives in bed, and if you're a woman of a certain age like me, regulating your body temperature and getting a good night's sleep can sometimes be a challenge. My old mattress was old school. It would overheat while my husband and I were in it together, causing us to toss and turn and not get a good night's sleep. And inevitably, when he was hot, I was cold and vice versa. There's nothing worse than tossing and turning or sweating in the night, whether it's because of the summer heat or your body heat. The pod cover by Eight Sleep will keep you cool all night, all the way down to 55 degrees Fahrenheit if that's the temperature you choose. So you wake up feeling fully refreshed. The pod cover by Eight Sleep fits on top of any bed like a fitted sheet, and it will improve your sleep by automatically adjusting the temperature on each side of the bed based on your and your partner's individual likings. It can cool down, it can warm up, and it adjusts based on the phases of your sleep and the environment that you're in. The other thing I love about Eight Sleep is it genuinely helps improve your sleep routine and your habits and your overall sleep quality. I really love the temperature control and that both me and my husband can set our side of the bed, uh, each to our own liking. And I love the gentle vibrating alarm that you set each morning. And I wake up feeling refreshed after a great night's sleep, allowing me to start the day off right. My husband loves Eight Sleep's technology, which is incredible. While the temperature part is the biggest game changer for me, the pod cover has other amazing features thanks to the pod's sleep and health tracking. You can wake up to a personalized sleep report for you each morning that offers insights into how certain behaviors like late night exercise or caffeine impact your sleep and overall health. The pod cover by Eight Sleep truly provides the ultimate sleep experience. I've never experienced sleep like this, and the pod's cooling technology has been a lifesaver for me at this phase of my life. So if you're a woman of a certain age like me, and we all know who we are, invest in the rest you deserve with the Eight Sleep pod. Go to eightsleep.com slash legal AF and save $150 on the pod cover. That's the best offer you'll find. But you must visit eightsleep.com slash legal AF for $150 off. Stay cool this summer with Eight Sleep, now shipping within the USA, Canada, and the UK and select countries in the EU and Australia. That's eightsleep.com slash legal AF. We've all heard the famous line, try it free for 30 days. Yeah, well, that's just enough time to try it and then completely forget about it. In fact, over 80% of people have subscriptions they forgot about. You could be wasting money and not even realizing it. Rocket Money helps you find those forgotten subscriptions so you can stop paying for the ones you don't use. Do you know how much your subscriptions really cost? Most Americans think they spend around $80 a month on subscriptions, but the actual total is closer to 200. If you don't know exactly how much you're spending every month, you need Rocket Money. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps you lower your bills all in one place. Over 80% of people have subscriptions they forgot about, and chances are you're one of them. Like that Stars app just to watch one show, or that free gaming trial you never actually use. Rocket Money will quickly and easily find your subscriptions for you, and for any you don't want to pay for anymore, just hit cancel and Rocket Money will cancel it for you. It's that easy. 
Rocket Money also helps you manage all your finances in one place and automatically categorize your expenses so you can easily track your budget in real time and also get alerted if anything looks off. Over 3 million people have used Rocket Money, saving the average person up to $720 a year. Stop throwing your money away. Cancel unwanted subscriptions and manage your expenses the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash legal AF. That's rocketmoney.com slash legal Legal AF. Shout out to our sponsors, without whom we would not be able to provide you with our show on a regular basis. So thank you for thank you for both of them today. Two defenses, they're already floating. John Lauro, <clears throat> we'll show a clip of it later. Karen, what do you think about those? The defenses are, you know, he, look, you got to say something, right? If you're a defense attorney, but the the the. First Amendment defense, which is the free speech defense, right? That's what he's going to say is that, look, in, in politics, people say all sorts of things and politicians say all sorts of things. And if we're going to start fact, you know, they people fact check each other, if we're going to start criminalizing political speech when they say things that are are not true, uh, you know, that's we that that's what John Lauro was, is, is trying to suggest. Um, you want to play the John Lauro clip and then you can react to it? Sure. Let's, let's play John Lauro, the new lawyer for Donald Trump, about First Amendment defense. In addition to his, him saying the First Amendment defense, he's also taken on the Donald Trump strategic uh, way of communicating, which is interrupting, talking over the person, not letting them finish their sentence. I mean, that's what Donald Trump does, right? It's this, dis, it's like, just be a bully and aggressive, and it's really... Um, well you know, John really, Lauro you know. is just Joe Tacopina, 50 pounds lighter. Yeah. Let's let, let's see it. So earlier this morning, we had the chance to speak to one of Mr. Trump's defense attorneys, John Lauro. We started with the timing of a trial. The special counsel said yesterday he would like to see a speedy trial. That yes. is 70 days from now. Are you ready uh, to go? Would you like to see a speedy trial? Well, the speedy trial right is the defendant's right, Correct. not the government's right. So we're entitled to understand what the charges are. We're entitled to do our own investigation. The special counsel or the Justice Department, the Biden Justice Department, has had three years to investigate this. Uh, to take President Trump to trial in 90 days, of course, is absurd. The question is, why do they want to do that? If you want to seek justice, then you need to offer Mr. President, President Trump an opportunity to get a hold of all the evidence and understand what the f Yeah. I don't think that was quite the clip. Do we have the other part of the clip, Salty, where he talks about First Amendment, right? Now, that was a clip of John, but it wasn't quite the clip we were looking for. While we're looking for that clip... Um, <laughs> Um, well, we'll get back I'll, to that in a minute. There were two other right. things I just wanted to mention about yeah. the indictment, and then we'll go back to that while Salty's yeah. looking for it. Sure. Um, so n number one, the thing that I thought was uh, kind of a blockbuster in the indictment was um, was the fact that Mike Pence is going to be the, the key witness. Like he's the victim, the witness, and he took notes you know, contemporaneous notes of his conversations with Donald Trump. Who does that? He was, I mean, and, and think about this just logistically. This is Trump's vice president, right? They, they were together and they were serving together. And you're going to have Mike Pence testify against the president that he served as the star witness, right? He's the witness to so much of this. And I just thought that was astonishing. And, and why did he take these notes, right? Why did he take these notes of his conversations with Trump? And he did it because for the same reason others took notes with their conversations with him, which is they're trying to cover themselves because they could tell they were being asked to do things that were criminal and, you know, that were illegal. And it, so he had these notes for, for protection for the future. So I thought that was, that was, you know, we all knew he was cooperating, but to the extent that he's going to play a leading role in this trial, I thought that that was really highlighted here. And the second thing that that st stood out to me about this trial or about this case was, you know, Fonnie Willis did a, did a good thing, which is she broadcasted to the world, really to Jack Smith, when she's when she's going, and that it's going to be a big detailed in, indictment, right? And she did that for several reasons. She said she did it for security reasons, and I was fairly confident that there was zero coordination. And we talked about this on uh, on one of our our legal AFs. There's no communication or coordination between Jack Smith and Fonnie Willis. And I know that just because I've been involved in these types of cases, and prosecutors don't do that, and won't 
won't do that. It's totally and utterly inappropriate. And it would be uh, put put everybody in a difficult position. And she confirmed as much that they ha there has been no coordination or communication. But she signaled to Jack Smith because, you know, there's going to be a lot of similarities in their cases, right? She's going to bring uh, the, the fake electors scheme in Georgia and potentially other states. And she knows Jack Smith was doing the same thing. And so she kind of signaled to Jack Smith, this is when I'm going. So if you're going to do it, do it first, because I don't want to screw up your case. So what Jack Smith and, and in the indictment, there are many pages where he details the fake elector scheme in each state. And he's got an Arizona section and a Michigan section and a Georgia section and so on, a Wisconsin section. And he talks about the facts of what the this fake elector scheme was in each of the states and he detail he put details in there and and that provided uh, a roadmap for fanny willis to make sure that at least her evidence doesn't conflict with his because boy would that be tricky right if one of them gets it wrong and they have conflicting uh theories conflicting narratives so i thought that was something else that uh that was done in the indictment that fonnie willis is as i bet she's going to be doing and she's going to be looking at her draft indictment and making sure that that they there is no conflicting uh evidence um and testimony uh that will come in at the trial so uh if you want to go back to the defenses, I don't know if we were well, able to. You know, I want to, yeah. Well, let's do it this way. I think they're, the defense of uh, reliance on counsel, I think, is a dead bang loser. You got Mike Pence already saying today that Donald Trump was surrounded by his quote, not mine, crackpot lawyers that were giving him bad advice. We know who the crackpot lawyers are. They're led by somebody who is all over. The indictment is littered with one other person other than Donald Trump. If I had to name one, it's Giuliani. Rudy Giuliani. Rudy Giuliani is all over the indictment, leading the charge, leading Team Crazy. So you got Rudy, who's recently come out and says, I'm not cooperating with Jack Smith. I'm not gonna, I'm telling the truth, and Donald Trump did nothing wrong, which of course is a ticket, is a fast train ticket to indictment land for Rudy Giuliani. He should know that as a former US attorney. Um but so the whole reliance thing doesn't work if the client is actually the one pulling the strings and um, brings in these people in order to give him cover for his cling to power and his thirst and lust for power. You can't bring in a bunch of people that nobody would rely on, even your own vice president and those that were around you. He did have comp some competent lawyers around him and all of them arrayed against him to tell him that he had lost the election, that there, all of his fraudulent um, uh, attacks on Joe Biden's win were false, were not right, were not corroborated. There was no evidence for it. There was no election dispositive fraud, as Jack Smith likes to say in the indictment, that would have change the outcome of the election or in any of the battleground states. Jack Smith took certain pains to say the only way that Donald Trump could have won the election, as he was told by his own election people, his own campaign manager, was if he won five states starting with Arizona. And that he and that he told Donald Trump there was a 10% chance you'd be able to run the table on those five states. And the next day, his own campaign and his own lawyers in a courtroom told the judge that they had lost Arizona. And that's in the indictment, very early on in the indictment. And for, and for Jack Smith, that's what starts it. You knew you lost Arizona. Your lawyers knew you lost Arizona. They told the judge you lost Arizona, and there was no coming back from that. The other scary thing about the indictment that I had never heard before, but for the first time saw in the indictment was about Jeff Clark. Now, I've heard a lot of crazy things about Jeff Clark, the number three or four who was was pining away in the last 12 days to be the attorney general because he's a big election denier, big MAGA, big MAGA, and um, has and believes in the unitary executive branch and that the president is a dictator and all that. Um, and I was like, okay, thank God this guy never got to be in the big chair as the attorney general because we know what he would have done because he had a draft letter on Department of Justice letterhead that he was prepared to send to election officials all around the country in the battleground states telling them that the Department of Justice on letterhead officially recognized election fraud and that they should recognize the fake elector certificates as real certificates. That Okay, so here's what happened. Here's what we knew happened, and then I'll tell you what's new in the indictment. What we knew happened is that there was almost a mutiny when Donald Trump tried to elevate uh, Jeff Clark into that role and write that letter and send that letter out. Pat Philbin and Patrick Cipollone 
told Donald Trump in no uncertain terms that they were going to leave and there was going to be a mutiny and all his lawyers were going to walk out, much like what happened in Nixon in the Midnight Massacre. What we didn't know was the conversation, the content of the conversation involving Jeff Clark, Donald Trump, and Pat Philbin. And we also didn't know until the indictment that Donald Trump offered the job of attorney general to Jeff Clark and he accepted it. We always thought it was it, it was um, a proposal that Trump floated, not that it was an offer and acceptance. So in paragraph 80 of the indictment, the indictment says, based on the facts, also on the morning of Jan 3, I mean, come on, we're like 17 days left in the administration and we're still picking new attorney generals, really? Also on the morning of Jan 3, co-conspirator number four, Eastman met with the defendant at the White House. I'm sorry, Jeff Clark. I said Eastman. Jeff Clark met with defendant at the White House, again, without having informed senior Justice Department officials, right? He's number four. He's not supposed to go meet with the president without his bosses knowing, like Jeff Rosen. Like, But tell them uh, why. Tell them why. What? what? It's not just pro- it's not just for protocol. It's not just for you know. It's- yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to read from the indictment. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. 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 Okay. And it- <laughs> and ex- okay. Let me start again. <laughs> again, without having informed senior Justice Department officials, and accepted accepted the defendant's offer that he become acting attorney general. We'd only heard rumors that that was something that Donald Trump was thinking about in the recesses of his brain, not that he had actually offered it and it was accepted. So for a moment, there was a moment where Jeff Clark thought he was the attorney general. The next paragraph says, on the afternoon on the afternoon of that same day, co-conspirator four, Jeff Clark, spoke with a deputy White House counsel. That's Pat Philbin. The previous month, uh, Pat Philbin had informed the defendant, Trump, That, quote, there is no world, there is no option in which you do not leave the White House on January 20th. Now that same deputy White House counsel, Philbin, tried to dissuade co-conspirator for Clark from assuming the role of acting attorney general. The deputy White House counsel reiterated to to Clark that there had not been outcome determinative fraud in the election and that if the defendant remained in office nonetheless, that there would be, quote, riots in every major city in the United States. Clark responded, quote, well, Pat, that's why there's an insurrection act. I mean, it is, I, I'm just, I just got a chill right down my spine that Jeff Clark was going to use the insurrection act as the head of the Department of Justice to crush riots in the streets. Now we go to the suspension of the Constitution and martial law being invoked in order for Donald Trump to stay in power. Go ahead, Karen. Yeah, so I was just gonna say the reason um, they kept telling Jeffrey Clark, the environmental guy, right? He, they, at one point they were like, can't you go find an oil spill or something to go deal with, right? The reason they, uh, they were telling him, you are not to speak to the president directly. The only people who are allowed to speak to the president directly are the attorney general and the act, or the deputy attorney general or the acting attorney general and the acting deputy attorney general is, is it's a very, very important to um, to have that protocol because you don't want in undue influence from the president on criminal prosecutions. This has to be it has you know all criminal prosecutions have to be have to be um, not have any political influence. They have to be without fear or fa- favor, and so that's why they do it like that. Uh, before we move on to to our next section, I just want to say two more things. Um, number one is uh, the defense of First Amendment. Uh, and and that's going to be one of his primary defenses is, look, you know, I can say whatever I want and I'm running, you know, I was the president. I can say what I want. I can say what I want. And Jack Smith did a great job of saying, yes, you can say what you want. And that is protected by the First Amendment. And you're even allowed to challenge an election uh, appropriately. You can ask for audits. You can go to court. You can, you know, do the, you can use a legitimate and appropriate means. But 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 what our listeners have to understand and what a lot of people know is the first amendment the right to free speech is not an absolute right you you do have a right to to say what you want to say you are even allowed to lie lies are protected by the first amendment but where it becomes criminal is when you lie to try and get something that you're not supposed to get 
like by fraud. So uh, an example that, that my friend Norman Eisen gave last night on television was, you know, you could, you know, people would say, look, I, I can, I can go, I can't go into a bank and say, you know, give me all your money and say, oh, I'm protected by free speech. You know, that that's just not okay because that's, that's causing someone to give, you know, holding up a gun and, or whatever, you know, pretending you have a gun and they're going to give you the money. Uh, you know, that becomes a crime. You don't have a free speech right to yell fire in a crowded theater right? Because that would cause, you know, stampede and whatever, unless there is a fire in a crowded theater, right? You can't just do that. So the First Amendment right is not absolute. And that defense is going is not going to fly. And the only other thing I want to um, say before we move on is I want to talk about the, uh, how great the judge is that we got here, right? That that was assigned to this case, right? Her name is Tanya Chutkin. She's an Obama appointee. She was picked at random and she has overseen many of the Jan 6 rioter cases. And, you know, she issues some harsh sentences. So, and she, she previously rejected Trump's attempt to avoid uh, disclosing some documents to the Jan 6 committee, you know, writing presidents are not kings. So I think she's a great judge. She will uh, not allow him to do his delay shenanigans. She'll keep tight control over the case. And there's a chance, I think if there's any chance that this case goes to trial before the election, we got a great judge for that. Well, that's a good segue to talk about Mar-a-Lago, where we're not sure we have a great judge. In fact, we're probably pretty sure we have one that is very inexperienced and over her skis. I mean, Tanya Chutkin is plying her trade in the DC Circuit Court, which is usually a, uh, a feeder a feeder program, or can be, to the US Supreme Court. You go DC Circuit Court, which is, which is, I would argue, there's probably three plums in the federal court system that you'd wanna be appointed to. Southern District, New York, Second Circuit that covers New York, maybe four, Federal Circuit, Court of Appeals and DC Circuit, and then the Court of Appeals for the DC Circuits. Maybe now that's five. But these are all potential places where people will end up. And usually from the DC Circuit, you end uh, the DC judge like this one, a circuit court judge, whose husband is also a former Superior Court judge in New York. So as I said on a hot take, it sort of runs in the family. Being a judge runs in the family, which is nice family business. But she is, before even this, I would have thought would have been on a short list for uh, much like Katanji Brown Jackson came out of that, went to the uh, Court of Appeals and then on to the Supremes and the other, and, and I can name a, a number of other people as well. If if uh, Joe Biden gets another opportunity to name somebody the U.S. Supreme Court, I mean now it's a little complicated, <laughs> given she's the judge that's presiding over, arguably you know one of the most historic federal trials in the history of federal trials. But it's I think it's clearly given her background her experience sentencing Gen 6 people. Um, we, what we used to call her, I used to call her Hang 'em High Chutkin because she she was the harshest of all the judges in sentencing. She's been opposed to Donald Trump, including the tax returns at the House Ways, Ways and Means Committee and getting those turned over. She was supported by the Supreme Court on that one. She's just a really great judge, not just for you know democracy. Yes, yes. Yeah. She's just a very, very good federal judge. In contrast, we've got Eileen Cannon. And now- we're pressure testing Eileen Cannon because, you know, the Department of Justice has another case there. And so last week it was, we're going to do a superseding indictment and bring in Carlos de Oliveira, the head of maintenance or maintenance worker, former valet, whatever he was, in terms of his role in trying to delete the server, drown the server, flood the server, whatever he was trying to do to help his boss, the boss, Donald Trump. And with, with um, unindicted co-conspirators listed there as well, including the number one cooperating witness right now, we believe, yes, Seal, you Seal Tavares, who's the IT worker who, who Walt Nauda is alleged, along with Carlos de Oliveira, to have enlisted in a conspiracy on behalf of the boss to delete the server and the surveillance videos that were lo located there so they didn't have anything to turn over to the Department of Justice. Now we've got a new issue because, you know, justice makes uh, strange bedfellows. Stan Woodward, who I think represents nothing but Jan 6 people, has not one, not two, not three, but five different either witnesses, co-conspirators, indicted co-conspirators. He represents all of them in the Mar-a-Lago indictment, including in the superseding indictment. Two of them have, who have been identified as employee number one and employee number two, or witness one and witness two, are 
Molly Michaels and Haley Harrison. They Haley Harrison works from for um, uh, Melania right now, but had worked for Donald Trump. And um, uh, Michaels had worked. Michael had worked for uh, Molly. Michael had worked as the Oval Office coordinator and head executive assistant for all things Donald Trump, including before the, the you know the election, after the election, Jan sixth and beyond. And the two of them were texting about moving the boxes, moving the documents, and and certainly Molly Molly uh, Michael was. Uh, is listed in the indictment as having texted with another lawyer for Donald Trump about Donald Trump returning boxes to the National Archive back in January. Though there were 15 of those boxes Donald Trump handled himself, including uh, returning the Iranian war document that is part of the indictment. So they're like critical witnesses about the movement of boxes and Donald Trump's instructions related to it. He also, Walt um, Stan Woodward represents Walt Nauda. He used to represent, there he is, he used to represent Yusil Tavares, the other co-conspirator who's not been indicted and is now cooperating, but only started cooperating after he fired uh, Stan Woodward, who's being paid by the Save America PAC. I forgot to mention that. He's one of the many lawyers that have drained the donor's money that was supposed to be for Donald Trump, but goes to Donald Trump's lawyers instead from a hundred million last year to 4 million this year. Part of that is Stan Woodward's law firm. So he represents the, those two women I just identified. He represents, represented the IT director. He represents Walt Nauda. It's like everybody but Carlos de Oliveira and the justice department is like, you know what? I think there's a conflict of interest there, Jack Smith, people are saying. And why don't we have what's called a Garcia hearing, named after a 1975 case um, in that district. Every district has a, has a case like that about conflicts of interest. Why don't we bring in Molly Michael all separately? Bring in uh, uh, Harrison separately. Bring in Yusil Tavares. Bring in these people and have the judge evaluate and make sure that they all understand that their lawyer represents them and their lawyer might be in a weird position where he's cross-examining his own clients to, to defend Walt Nauda. And before we go that far, Judge, why don't you look into whether he should be disqualified or not? So we got that. And then we got what happened with Carlos de Oliveira, who's supposed to have his arraignment. Karen, why don't you comment on both of those things? So look, I, I think I did a hot take. Um, I'm not sure it's been out. It's come out yet about you know who your lawyer is matters and why it matters to have uh, your lawyer paid by Donald Trump and why that's significant, right? Some people might think, oh, that's so nice of him. You know, he paid for paying for his lawyer. I mean, he did get him into this situation after all. Um, but you know, it, it reminds me of of I, I think about you know, back in the day when, when um, prostitution, for example, used to be prosecuted by the Manhattan DA's office and, and you'd have these women who would be, you, you knew they were being um, human trafficked and beaten and assaulted and, you know, just really um, sexually assaulted. You knew they were the victims of these horrible crimes, but their pimps would hire their lawyers, pay for their lawyers, and the pimps would sit there in court and watch them basically you know, you can just see they could never come forward and and come to us so that we could help them and get them out of that situation because their their lawyer was being paid for by their pimp and you know they can't now go against them and and same thing with drug dealers right you'd have these low level um, drug dealers that you'd catch on the street the cops would catch them on the street and you know you'd have the cartels or the gangs the big gangs would the ones who never you know, go near the stuff who just kind of run the business, they would pay for their lawyers. And once again, you know, they'd get caught up in it and couldn't get themselves out of it so that we could get the big fish. So this is very similar in that way. You know, you, you any, if, if Trump is paying for these lawyers, then, you know, how is the lawyer going to have, um, you know, if, if the lawyer's beholden to Trump, but what's in the best interest of someone like Walt Nada or, or Mr. De Oliveira is to cooperate against Trump, you know, it creates this conflict. Like they can't, they're not going to, um, you know, in any way, do something that would harm the guy who's paying their bill. Same when you're representing more than one defendant, right? If you're representing multiple defendants, let's say you have one that's more culpable than the other, one that was the ringleader and one wasn't, you know, you, you can't use information that's adverse to the other 
client against the other one. And so if you can't use all the information you have, you're not representing your client to the fullest. So, you know, it, it also just strikes me that we heard from, you remember during the Jan 6 committee, Cassidy Hutchinson testified that, you know, she couldn't come forward, she couldn't cooperate because she had this, you know, Trump paid for lawyer who basically was telling her things like, look, it's okay to say you don't remember. It's okay that, you know, don't, don't go refreshing your memory. Don't, you know, you don't have to really give them too much information. You know, that's just, just kind of say you don't remember. And she's like, but what if that's a lie? And she went in and spoke to the select committee and came out and said, I'm effed because I lied. And she realized then she needed to get her own lawyer. She got her own lawyer. And that's when she felt comfortable, like yeah. she could come forward and tell the truth. She and hired Jody Hunt, which was a very independent lawyer. Yeah. Who's and that's why people like right. Jeff Sessions and others. Right. And then she finally yeah. came clean. Right. Exactly. So that's, and then as you just pointed out, we saw it with, with UCL Tavares, right? You know, it was, as soon as he got his own lawyer, he also, you know, he got a target letter, he gets his own lawyer, he dumps Stan Woodward, and now he's cooperating and didn't find himself as an unindicted co-conspirator. So who your lawyer is matters. And kudos lot. to the prosecutor to put them in, a, in, put them in a jackpot situation where they have to make a decision. You yeah. know, UCL Tavares probably thought, oh, I skated by, I'm not going to be indicted. Oh, wait, target letter? Oh, wait, hold it. <laughs> wait, I didn't realize there was going to be. And, and who knows what Stan Woodward is telling him. I can tell, let me just make a public service announcement. If you want to be indicted, hire Stan Woodward. He'll never cut a deal for you while he's being paid by Save America PAC and by Donald Trump. He's beholden to one client, and that guy's name is Donald Trump. And if you are just some lowly worker that used to work for Donald Trump and you got caught up in his conspiracy, go get, as Karen said, go get your own lawyer and cut a deal. You too may be able to escape liability, but not if Stan Woodward's your lawyer. I mean, I don't know what's going to come out of the hearing, but that's coming out of the Popak Karen Freeman Kniflo hot take right now. Jack Smith does not want to prosecute the low level maintenance guy, right? He wants to flip them. He, this, yeah. These guys aren't criminals. Like these pancakes. guys. No, but like they, they're not like they didn't, they're, they're not sort of career criminals who woke up one day and said, you know what I want to no, do? Right. I want to possess and hide classified documents. <laughs> the maintenance I wanna... workers not keeping Jack Smith up at night. Yeah, right. exactly. So, right. you know, they're just caught up in this mess. By the way, I always thought it was a Curcio hearing, the conflict. I never heard of it as a Garcia hearing. Well, it is, it is a Curcio hearing. Yeah, but in, in, but they, Jack, you know, because he's a local guy now, <laughs> he used the uh, precedent from the Fifth Circuit, which was the oh. circuit in, that covered at the time. People might be saying, I thought Popak, it's the 11th Circuit for Florida. It is, but it was the Fifth Circuit until they split and made a new circuit called the 11th Circuit. And the case down there is called the Garcia hearing, but um, it's it's what you're referring to. It's it, it's known like that. Um, so we had that, and then it, you just just like like a little sprinkle, a little sprinkle of the arraignment being postponed, and then we'll move on to what's going on with Fawny Willis. Yeah. So once again, you know, straight out of the Trump uh, playbook, right? I don't have a Florida lawyer, oops. you know. So oops. <laughs> so he, you know, he shows up without a Florida lawyer, and I mean, there's thousands of Florida lawyers, like, and everybody knows about this case, right? <laughs> Not That's me. So, it's so deliberate and so intentional, again, to delay again by another week, another two weeks, another month. And so he's not going to be arraigned now until what? Is it August 10th? The, yeah, August 10th or August 11th. He had to post a $100,000 bond. Look, Carlos de Oliveira is in deep, deep shit. He, he's the guy, as you, as I heard you say on one of your hot takes, one of your commentaries, you don't believe in coincidences. They just flooded the server room. I mean, first they tried to get the server. Then they tried to choke the server. Then they tried to stab it. And when they couldn't stab it, they were going to drown it. I mean, this they were trying to do anything they could think of to satisfy the, the boss's demand. Huh? I just think it's so – it's like something out of like – Light it on fire was going to be next, I'm sure. <laughs> it's just so, it's like it's something that you would see in one of those like you know 1980s Bill Murray you know stupid oh, yeah. camp movies where oh, meatball. it's you know, meatballs yeah yeah something like that <laughs> like, let's flood the server let's drain right. the pool and flood the server my, room like it's my so favorite dumb. fact and it's, we're gonna get more about it when it gets to trial is I've had a lot of weak IT people in my life that work with me but I cannot believe that you seal Tavares as an IT person, didn't know how to delete the server. His first reaction, I'm sure, because he was like, I don't want to do this, was like, oh, I, I don't know how to delete a server. 
<laughs> really? <laughs> but thank God he didn't because, you know, and that may well be, we're, you know, putting all joking and jocularity aside for a moment, although we are understandably happy about what's transpired. Um, you're always looking for that moment in history when somebody at that level ends up ripping the mask off and reveals the fraud in the scheme. Yeah. Fawn Hall shreds the documents for Oliver North in the Iran-Contra scandal. Nixon's secretary deletes the 18 minutes in Watergate, right? This is all con consciousness of guilt. You don't do these things if you're not guilty of something. That's the gold standard for prosecutors, right? And 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 Bill Clinton, God bless his soul, goes and tells Betty Curry, his assistant, to try to get back gifts that he gave Monica Lewinsky during the middle of his denial of having any kind of relationship with her. And these are those moments, and we're seeing it now. The boss wants you to delete the server. Is that moment, or could be that moment, at least in Mar-a-Lago prosecution for Donald Trump. Let's go to Georgia. Fawny Willis, who, God, I love her. I just can't, I can't express my love for Fawny more. more. Fawny Willis, who, while she's biding her time, finishing up with her regular purpose grand jury, her regular grand jury, trying to get the indictment, which, um, spoiler alert, she's going to get an indictment against Donald Trump. It will be later this month. Was doing things for the community that elected district attorneys do, like back to school events at parks all over Atlanta, Georgia, where she gives low cost school supplies and backpacks to, to parents and students. It's a really great thing. And her local reporter caught up with her and said, Hey, Bonnie, uh, while you're doing your backpack event, which we know you love, uh, what's going on with the jury? And she said the following One, my work is done. We're ready to go. I have to do it for the people of Fulton County. I have to do it for the people of America. Some people may not like my decision, and some of those people may be violent, but I think we're ready. And all she needs is probably another day or two, and she's going to get that indictment. Why? Because, she, of course, she stands on the shoulders of seven months or almost a year and a half of investigation and seven months of a special purpose grand jury, 75 witness transcripts, hundreds and hundreds and thousands of exhibits that she's able to use, because you're allowed to do that in Georgia, in her regular grand jury. So she picks up where the special purpose grand jury left off, except now she's got the indicting mechanism in the regular grand jury. So she's effing close. I mean, if she doesn't get it in the next week or two, and then unseals it, coordinate it with the sheriff, and then my favorite thing, I'll turn it over to you, Karen, is the sheriff who um, has already cleared the streets in early August, telling everybody to work from home because we're we don't want any riots down there, has also said that um, he's not going to give special treatment to Donald Trump. If he gets indicted, he's going to get mug and arrested. He's going to get mug shot, fingerprinted, and processed just like everybody else. I love Georgia. What do you have to love say about guy. all that? <laughs> I love that guy. I mean, how great was that, right, that he said that? Because, <laughs> you know, he hasn't – everywhere else they haven't done a mug shot or whatever. They, they're kind of treating him. He's kind of like, nope, he's going to be treated like everybody else. <laughs> I thought that was great. Yeah. So any 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 things you've picked up in your own reporting or investigation about about Fawny? How about, how about this? Because you've been very good at this, um, among other things is the, the kind of the scope, the size of Fawny's indictment, because you were really dead on. I gave you a shout out right at the top of me coming on to the live podcast uh, show we did last night where I said, you know who nailed it in terms of, you know, four counts, one defendant, Karen Freeman Ignifilo, as opposed to a more sprawling. But, you know, she's got a different, Fawny's got a different audience. She's got a different a, 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 a justice system. She's got a different um, set of stakeholders. She's got a different investigation with more people to it and more whatever. What, what, what do you, are we going to see, let, let's put it on the extreme. If, if Jack Smith's is surgical, precise, and very um, efficient and with word economy and, and count economy, where do you think, and, and then you have the prolix ones that a unseasoned prosecutor that you described earlier would just with every count and every defendant and every fact and every, just kind of look, you know, 50 pounds of potatoes in a 10 pound sack on the other end of the continuum. Where do you think Fawny's is going to fall? So I think Fawny's going to fall on the other end of the continuum 
pretty squarely in the 50 pound sack of potatoes and a 10 pound <laughs> sack, but not for the reasons that I think she's not um, experienced or qualified or not doing a, a great job. I think it's, I think she's doing it for a different reason. And I think if I were her, I'd probably be in the same boat. You know, you, you have to remember, let's, let's think about where Fani, where, how this came about. The Department of Justice, by all accounts, didn't do anything for the first year and a half. And Donald Trump is throwing that, you know, is, is literally throwing that in uh, in everybody's face and saying, why is this happening now, right? It wasn't until the Jan 6 committee did their amazing historic work and they're gonna go down in history as, you know, they, they all, including Liz Cheney, who, you know, committed political suicide uh, in order to set the record straight and do this investigation and do these hearings. That was the kick in the pants to the Department of Justice. Fonnie Willis uh, was sitting there the whole time going, DOJ, where are you? There was a crime here. And so she had no choice but to do this big, sweeping, sprawling investigation. She was well underway by the time Jack Smith was finally appointed. Now, Jack Smith has moved in lightning speed, which is also something that I told everybody would happen only like the, the reason I know how Jack Smith is going to do things and that he's going to be fast, that this is going to speed it up, that, you know, he's going to walk and chew gum at the same time and do all these indictments and what the indictment's going to look like is partly because we were trained by this in the same office, by the same people at the same time. Like we just, we know the same things. And so that's partly, you know, kind of how, how I'm able to, to know these things about him. And, you know, he's done it at lightning speed, but it, it's still, Still, you know, Fonnie Willis had had a, a year and a half, two years waiting for the Department of Justice to do something, and they didn't. So she did a big sweeping investigation, and that's what she has. And so she's just going. She at this point, that's what she has. That's where she is, and so she's going to bring her case. And I also think it makes sense that she's going to bring, bring the big sweeping case because, you know, God forbid you have Donald Trump wins the presidency, okay? God forbid he does. He's either going to pardon himself or he's going to, if, if, he's, if he's convicted or not, he's gonna to try to pardon himself on the Jan 6 and other cases. But he's also, let's say it's still pending and it hasn't gone to trial, you know what he's gonna do? He's gonna, his own attorney general, he's gonna throw out that case. He's gonna tell him to stop the case, throw it out of court and not prosecute it. So the, the only case that will go down in history as, as really holding everybody accountable who did exactly what they did on January 6th, all of them, Giuliani, Eastman, Cheesebro, you know, Clark, Sidney Powell, you know, Boris Epstein, all of them and more is, are going to be held accountable also by Fonnie Willis. And she needs to do it. It needs to be done. And it's pardon proof. So, so I think that's why hers is going to be the opposite of Jack Smith's. It's sort of a you know, she she got herself into that situation because the Department of Justice wasn't doing anything. She is where she is. It's pardon proof, and it's also important, you know, for for the for the for like the record keeping of history that these people are held accountable, right? You know, this is this is not just somebody who committed crimes. This is people for the first time in our nation's history that you have a concerted effort to try to steal the country, to rule by fiat, to steal the presidency and and take away our democracy, right? And that's, I mean, if, if D Jack Smith's very short press conference yesterday, I think said it perfectly. I think he, he spelled it out perfectly why this case is different from all other cases. He said why the Capitol Police officers were heroes, why they're national heroes. He said it wasn't just because they protected the, the Capitol building or because they protected the men and women who were inside the Capitol that day. It's because they put their lives on the line to protect our democracy. That's what this case is about. And so you, you're going to have this, this autocrat, this this person, Donald Trump and his his henchmen, they're going to try and make it so this case is 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 erased and nobody's held accountable. And and little Fonnie Willis down in Fulton County, Georgia, and I'm, I'm calling her little not because of her stature, but because she is just this little Fulton County, you know, in Georgia, one county in one state in this country is going to be one of the few people who can and will hold uh, the, those responsible for trying to uh, for trying to um, overthrow our democracy accountable. So I applaud her. And that's what I expect to be coming yeah. in the coming weeks. 
And and Donald Trump is afraid of her because he's tried um, everything he can do to throw sand into the gears of justice and try to get in her eyes and try to get rid of Fonnie Willis and try to get rid of her office, try to get rid of the special purpose grand jury where he knows 75 people already testified, including Rudy Giuliani, including uh, Mark Meadows, including, um, you know, I think her case is very scary to him because he knows what he did, right? He knows what he did last summer. And one of the things he did last summer was make multiple phone calls into the state, including to Brad Raffensperger, uh, along with Rudy Giuliani, and another one with Mark Meadows, in which he tried to interfere with the election. So, <clears throat> pardon me, on two recent occasions, Donald Trump has tried to disqualify um, her and her office and tried to get the whole special purpose grand jury and their work, their report, their recommendations thrown out. First, they went two weeks ago with a direct petition to the Georgia Supreme Court, where I guess they thought they had uh, um, a kindred spirit or a friendly ear, nine Republican uh, appointed uh, Supreme Court justices. And they rejected the petition 9-0 and said, you know what, we don't see it about any grounds to disqualify Fonnie Willis and the DA, if you have that issue, go bring it up below to Fulton County or some other place, but not directly to this court, which generally sits as a court of appeals, not as a place to decide matters in the first instance. And also, we're not really comfortable with you interfering with a pre-indictment process. This sounds familiar. This sounds like what they did last summer when they interfered through Judge Cannon and had a willing audience there to interfere pre-indictment with Mar-a-Lago. And there... Um, which I'm going to talk about next with Judge McBurney and his special order that just came out, denying the motion to remove Fawny Willis, denying a bid again to throw out the special purpose grand jury. Um, they reference the Cannon decision at the federal level as with special delight, I'm sure. So you got Georgia Supreme Court says, we're not tossing the special purpose grand jury. You don't really have standing to do that now. It's pre-indictment and we're the wrong court. And we don't see the grounds for Fawny Willis being disqualified. That didn't stop them. They had filed uh, Drew Finling and another lawyer for Donald Trump his lawyers in Georgia had filed in March a motion to quash the, you know, to suppress or quash the actual special purpose grand jury work and its report. That's called quashal for those that I like love that, that word, that kind of stuff. I see Karen likes that kind of stuff to preclude and to recuse, meaning to disqualify Fawny Willis. And in a very nice nine page opinion written by Judge McBurney, who um, I'm gonna I'm gonna read some from some of it, including the footnotes. Said, um, I'll, let me just cut to the chase. No, I'm not disqualifying Fawny Willis. You haven't given me any grounds to show either that she has forensic misconduct, which is required in Georgia, or that she has a conflict of interest. And since you haven't shown me any of that, I'm not disqualifying your prosecutor. She's doing what she's supposed to do. She's not supposed to be unbiased. She's supposed to be fair, yes, but she has a point of view. That point of view points her wherever the evidence points her, and I'm going to let her do her job. As to the special purpose grand jury, this is from Judge McBurney's order on page two of nine. Um, he said, well, you know better, Trump, because you tried a pre-indictment attempt to have a court interfere pre-indictment with a criminal investigation. And you were told by the 11th Circuit, this is the Cannon decision. This is now throwing shade on Judge Cannon. You were told by the 11th Circuit, not once but twice, you can't do that. You don't have standing because you're not yet injured because you're only the target or the subject of a criminal investigation. I mean, in Georgia, we're not talking about the three indictments or four indictments Donald Trump has in other places, but in Georgia, he is only a targeted individual. He is not yet an indicted individual. And until you're injured by getting an indictment, if and when that day ever comes, or as Judge McBurney said, perhaps and perhaps, until then, get out of my courtroom. You got nothing to talk about. And you have no standing to talk about it. And then he said the thing that will live on in history. In footnote, in footnote three, on page two of McBurney's order, he said that, yes, I agree with you. Generally, having a indictment looming against you could be a really bad thing. And yes, there's a little bit of a stain of that that may not be erased by having the indictment eventually tossed or thrown out if you're able to do that. However, 
In footnote three, he compared Donald Trump to Rumpelstiltskin, a name I hadn't heard since I was about three and a half. And what he said was, but for some, being the subject of a criminal investigation can, a la Rumpelstiltskin, be turned into golden political capital, making it seem more providential than problematic. Regardless, simply being the subject or target of an investigation does not yield standing to bring a claim to a halt, to, to bring a claim to halt the investigation into court. Love that, love that, love that. And the other place where the judge, I thought very fairly and very even-handedly said, um, you, you're, you're calling out Fawny Willis because you don't like the fact that she tweeted or she retweeted something or that somehow shows bias. And the judge says, I've seen the evidence you've presented such as it is, meaning there's not much of it. And I don't see any indication that Miss Willis or anybody in her office has already pre-decided the case against you, has has already believes you're guilty before bringing the indictment, or um, has any kind of bias or animus against you that would constitute misconduct. However, if you're talking about the amount of times that both sides have gone to the media, let me comment on that. And that's why I love McBurney, because he's he's not going to let Fawny Willis off the off the hook either. He said, and I quote from page seven of his order, and as for the forensic misconduct, that's a term of art in Georgia, which both sides, while both sides have done enough talking, posting, tweeting, and then in parentheses, he put Xing and press conferencing to have hit and perhaps stretched the bounds of Georgia rules of professional conduct. Neither movement has pointed to any averments from the district attorney or her team of lawyers expressing a belief that Trump or Latham, there's a Kathy Latham joined in on this motion. She's the Coffee County uh, GOP head who opened the doors and let cyber ninjas and Sidney Powell in to steal election data and image servers, speaking of servers, of private confidential voter data to use in their crazy scheme to try to overthrow the election. She she will be indicted by, uh, no doubt, she will be indicted by um, Fawny Willis. So, uh, so he said that rather, there's no averments for the district attorney or a team of lawyers expressing a belief that Trump or Latham is guilty or has committed this or that offense. Rather, the consistent and persistent theme has been the standard fare of pursuing the evidence where it leads us, holding everyone accountable, and no one being above the law. The drumbeat from the district attorney has neither has been neither partisan in the political sense nor personal in marked and refreshing contrast to the stream of personal invective flowing from one of the movements. Let me guess, Donald Trump? Put differently, the district attorney's office has been doing a fairly routine and legally unobjectionable job of public relations in a case that is anything but routine. Motion denied. Uh, and the next stop on the train for them is going to be to try to appeal that back to the Georgia Supreme Court or an intermed intermediary appellate court right there in the middle. Or there's already just to kind of round the, the round the square the circle. There is another motion you might have heard of in which they brought a motion to disqualify Bonnie Willis for a third time and McBurney, the guy that just issued the order that's pending but has not been ruled upon yet, but is being handled in another county because of the conflict of interest uh, that, that starts when you start attacking a judge by having another Fulton County judge decide whether a colleague has done something wrong. So it's been shipped off to another county. There'll be a hearing. It'll be after the indictment. Nobody cares. Fawny Willis is not getting disqualified and McBurney isn't either. And the special purpose grand jury work is going gonna, is gonna, is gonna to be used the way it's being used properly in the grand jury process. What do you think about McBurney in that order? First of all, it's beautifully written. It's you know pithy and snarky in in the way that only judges can can be. So I, I really enjoyed it, and you know the way he sort of did it subtly in footnotes, etc. Um, you know, it's it's. I thought I thought it was really smart the way he um, set it up so that people can understand, anyone can understand, you know, I think judges are conscious of the fact that lay people are reading uh, their decisions about Donald Trump 
you know, because and, and the media, et cetera, and people are interested more so than they are in typical other judge orders and decisions and indictments. And so they're being written in ways that anyone can understand. And and what struck me, there were just two, you know, you, you summarized it beautifully and perfectly. So I'll just, I'll just rather than go over all what you did already, I'll just mention two more things. Um, the thing I thought he did the the best was describe how, how, and, and as you said, Donald Trump knows this already, how really you're not, there is no standing, meaning there's no, you have no right to have a court interfere when there's no criminal case yet, just an investigation. And so he did a great job at explaining why and why it is that there has to be some kind of harm or injury and, and just, you know, having an investigation against you doesn't count. And in fact, for you, Trump, it's actually helped you. So you're not, not only are you not harmed, you're helped because you're raising so much money with this. So it's just one more time to underscore that when there's an investigation, uh, when, when, when there's an investigation, uh, it, it doesn't, um, there, there is no opportunity to have a judge inter, interfere with that. Wait, wait until there's a case brought, and then, and then you can make your motions. Right, that's number one. And number two, he also acknowledged tacit tacitly acknowledged that that Trump will try to remove this case. He, he acknowledged that Trump's going to try to remove this case from state court to federal court the way Trump did with Alvin Bragg, right? He went to Alvin Hellerstein and tried to get the case removed uh, to the Southern District of New York. And Hellerstein said, no, that, that was personal, right? You have to meet several different standards to get a case removed from state court to federal court. You have to have been acting under the color of law. Uh, meaning you have to have been acting uh, with, you know, at least pretend, you know, pretending to have the authority or, or acting like you had the authority to do it, you know, within your job. And you also have to, there has to be a federal crime or a federal interest implicated, and you have to also have a federal defense. Um, and, and in that, and in the Alvin Bragg case, none of those, he was a federal, you also have to be a federal officer. And in the Alvin Bragg case, Judge Hellerstein said, okay, I'll give you that you're a federal officer, but you don't have any of the other, the other things. You weren't acting under the color of law. This was personal. He was your personal lawyer and you didn't have any um there's there's no federal issues here or defenses i think i think in this particular case it's slightly different i think here he's a federal officer and here he was acting under the color of law he was acting like he had the authority to uh to to do this and it involved federal election so i think that this case might be removed to federal court and uh and if it, if that happens don't worry that doesn't kick fonny willis off the case she'll still be the prosecutor and georgia law will still be the law that is heard it'll just be heard in a district court uh federal courtroom in the northern district of florida so i think really really people would say then why is trump doing that and i think it's for several reasons. Number one, delay once again, right? Because now you're going to fight over this and there's going to be motion practice. And and then therefore it could it could delay things because again, that's his number one tactic. He doesn't ever want to go to trial on any of these things. And then the other reason is it's forum shopping, right? He he somehow thinks he'll have a better chance at a better job. I'm sorry, at a better judge federally than he will in the States. So so I thought that those were just the, the only things I, I would add. I, I agree with you. Yeah, that's really great. He, he definitely follows the news and he knows about the attempt at removal from state to federal court. I think, not to give Donald Trump's lawyers any ideas, I think that's a very close call and it probably could get sucked across the street to the federal courthouse. Northern District of Georgia it may not help him. One of the judges in the Northern District of Georgia is Nina Totenberg's sister, for those that follow NPR. And uh, Judge Totenberg was involved with forcing um, uh, Lindsey Graham to testify. So there are some democratically appointed judges in uh, by Democratic presidents in the Northern District of Georgia. So that may not help him. I, he may want to see first which judge in Fulton County ends up being his judge. I'm not sure it's going to be McBurney. I think it's another random wheel assignment. In fact, McBurney, I think, has said it's not going to be me. Um, but we'll see. Maybe because he handled the, the, the grand jury process, he doesn't. He, he is excluded under their, under their selection process. And then lastly, because it comes up all the time in the chat, and I wanted to anticipate it, uh, people might say, um, yeah, but there's a governor in Georgia that's a Republican, so he'll get pardoned. No, good news. 
Uh, Georgia has a very unique uh, pardon process. First of all, the governor is not responsible for it. He has no power. They had a lot of corrupt governors. Surprise! They had a lot of corrupt governors in Georgia, and they took away the pardon power because they were using it. They were doing like pay to play. People were paying off governors to get pardons, and so they didn't like that. And they decided to have a state board. So there's a state board. It's it's appointed. There's some Democrats on there, some Republicans on there. But you have to serve the first five years of your sentence before you can even apply to the state board. So I don't think that's what Donald Trump's trying to find. I don't think I don't think he's happy with that. Um, and that would apply even as Karen said, even just to be clear, even if it went across the street to the Northern District of Georgia federal court, right? The crimes are state crimes. That's just going to be the courtroom for the trial and the judge to handle process. That's not the, that's not the place for anything else. In fact, I'm not even sure. I want to look into this next time, Karen, you and me. I want to look at whether federal rules of, of criminal procedure apply on a removal of a state case. I wonder if it does or if they still apply Georgia. My gut is that their federal rules probably apply, but that's an interesting thing you and I can look at for a hot take, perhaps. But we've reached the end of another edition, historic (laughs) edition. When I signed up for this gig, I didn't think we'd have a former president with four indictments and a fifth one to come. But then again, I'm not not sure we'd have a show going this long if we didn't have (laughs) something like Donald Trump. Um, You know, he's like Haley's Comet. Hopefully we see somebody like him never again, or at least every every few hundred years. Um, but But we're at the end and people ask, how do we support the cause? How do we support Midas Touch Network, Legal AF? We like the Wednesday show. We like the Saturday show. I always love the competition. Wednesday's better than Saturday. Saturday's better than Wednesday. I love Karen. Popak talks too much. Ben, shut up. I mean, everybody's got an opinion. We love them all. I don't care. This is what makes the big blue marble roll along. How do you support us? Everything I'm going to tell you about is absolutely 100% free. I feel like a, I feel like an infomercial in the middle of the night. Totally free. Midas Touch Network, YouTube channel. Subscribe to it. Hit plus, subscribe. Free. All of our content is there. Our podcast is there. All the past episodes of our podcast. Hot takes that Karen Friedman, Ignifilo, Ben Mycellus, and I do almost every day, every hour are there. There's playlists to get dedicated to each of us individually as well. So that's a place to go. But you knew that. You're watching us right now. If we're not, you know, hopefully we'll be top three in YouTube live. We're going to check it as we're doing the show. Top then, one. You know, one's nice. We were one yesterday. We've You and I have been, I don't know if we've ever been one. We've, we've been, been two. two. We've, we've been two. We've been two. We got beat by like sharks once, a <laughs> soccer match or something, World Cup game, something. Then go over to the audio platforms. Even if you watch this on YouTube, just go subscribe and listen. It helps the algorithms over on Spotify and Apple, Google, all places that you pull your podcast from. That's this. Everything I'm talking about is free, 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 free. Go on and review us in all those places that you listen to your podcast. That helps. Um, and, and give us a five-star review and tell us what you think related to that. Then, and, and this is, I'm so excited. Well, I'm, I'm going to tease it first. We got new merchandise. And Karen was responsible for it, along with Jordy. But before we get there, there's a launch of a new website. When I joined the Midas Touch guys, brothers, two, three years ago, they had, I'm going to say it out loud, they had a crappy website. It was okay. Actually, the entire network was a, was not a network. It was a website. It was okay. I used to send them like, you know, Super Mario Brothers racing in the middle of the street during COVID on Fifth Avenue. I would send them video and that actually would go up as content. That's how crappy that website was. You know what's not crappy anymore? The new turbocharged muscular website just relaunched for Midas Touch. Go on that. You'll find not only all of our podcasts, all of us there, but you'll have daily, hourly, minute-by-minute content. We talk about an indictment, it gets posted there. You know, we got writers, we've got, you know, contributors, we got Brett Mysalis keeping track of everything. It's one-stop shopping for everything you want to know about news, politics, law and politics, intersection, MidasTouch.com. Com. We'll put that up. You guys can click it while you're here. And then finally, drum roll, please. We have redesigned. Look at those. Those are so beautiful. I'm, I'm going to bring a tear to my eye. Legal AF new merch in all in unisex and non non unisex cut T-shirts. 
Those logos were designed by a friend of Karen Friedman Agnifilos, who's designed a lot of logos for, look at these, for uh, for uh, sports franchises. And that person loves democracy and did a freebie. And look at these things. You got a choice of four. You got classic. You got crest. You got emblem. You got round. And you can put them mix and match on all the different t-shirts. We got blue. We got another shade of blue. We got We got fuchsia. And we got the original old school OG legal AF uh, logo there. This is outstanding. You go on, you pick your cl- you pick your emblem, you pick your logo, you put it on your shirt, you get your size, and there you go. And then I want to see people, if they will, please post these photos of you wearing this new gear on your social media, your X, your threads, your whatever, your Facebook. And let us see you enjoying what we have because. We had a crappy set of products before, and Karen put her foot down, and now look what we have now. Karen, what do you think about those products? I love it. So Todd Radom, look him up. He's fascinating, R-A-D-O-M. He's literally a a graphic designer for most major league sports. He not only has redesigned the uniforms for most major league teams, he also does the events of any major league sport. So whether it's like the Super Bowl has a patch and a logo, you know, he does all of that. And he's just fascinating and brilliant. And as you said, loves our democracy. And he designed designed these logos for us and we wanted them to be flexible and nimble. Pick your logo, which one you like, pick your color shirt. Hopefully we'll, we have two colors now. Hopefully we'll have more, uh, so, you know, if, if these, if people like these and ask for them, maybe we'll even have other merchandise, you know, with these new logos like mugs, etc., hats. So we're really excited to have these things. Hopefully people will buy them and, you know, I, I love it. I think it's great. So it's yeah, pretty, just, if, pretty if you go on, if you go on uh, www.toddradom.com, you'll see the amazing major league sports teams in every sport that he has, um, his, that he's been involved with, his team has been involved with, and he redesigned ours. When I say redesigned, we're just to be clear, we're keeping the album cover art. You know, our original art, that's how you're going to find us wherever you find us on podcasts. But for people that want to wear it, we thought these are so beautiful to wear along with the Midas Touch logo. So we've been teasing it for months. Karen's been working on it around the clock. I can't tell you how many text chains I've been involved with about look and feel and color. We need a pink. We need a blue. Why isn't this? What happened to Midas Touch name? And Jordy, I thought, was going to blow whatever gasket was in his head. But we did it. And you've seen it. Now go on and MidasTouchStore.com and go, go help yourself. This is the end of the show. We've reached that end. I'll see you Saturday with Ben Micellis and watch us on all the hot takes that we that we generate. Karen, always a pleasure to do it with you. Shout out. Legal AFers and the Midas Mighty.